Good morning. So some of you have asked how my birthday was. Y'all sang happy birthday to me last week, and I turned 50 two days later, so I can finally stop saying I'm almost 50. I can now officially say I'm 50. Uh, but some of you have asked how my birthday went, and, and I, I, thought I'd, I'd, I thought I'd let you know. Uh, I celebrated it a day early. My, my birthday was on Tuesday. Uh, I worked on Tuesday. I, I went out for a nice, nice lunch, but other than that, I worked all day Tuesday, but Monday, uh, a day early, I celebrated, and here's how I celebrated. Uh, my lovely wife and I, we went to the golf course, and we played a round of golf. Uh, now, now, you don't have to worry if you're like, man, Randy, Randy my, my identity, or your identity in my mind has always been that you're a hunter and a fisherman. You know, Pastor Randy is a hunter and a fisherman, and that's still true. Uh, there's, no, there's no risk of that, uh, be, of those hobbies being replaced uh, with golf. Uh, but, but nonetheless, uh, I actually did enjoy celebrating a uh, day early by playing golf. But I want to tell you a little bit about the nuance of that day and see if maybe you can relate, even if you're not a golfer. Here's how the day began for me. Uh, I, 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 I headed out to the course, and I had this, I didn't even tell Lydia, but I had this, this excitement um, over the potential that that day held. If you're an early morning kind of a person, you rise early, especially, I feel this every time I go fishing. Uh, there's this sense of, of, like, this day is just, just full of potential. This could, be, this could be such a good day. Who, who knows what's going to happen? But, but, but back to the, this, this, this golf outing. Uh, so for me, uh, for me that day, there was, this, there was this excitement over the potential that I could... I mean, it's not beyond the realm of possibility. I could possibly shoot par. Uh, never mind the fact that I haven't played golf in about 20 years. Today, maybe I could shoot par, right? <laughs> and, and, then, and then if I shot par on Monday, you know what I was going to do? Heck, Tuesday is my birthday. I'll go back on Tuesday. And, and I'm, I j it, it's possible... It's, I, I, could, I could shoot par on Tuesday, and then I could, I could, I could run a string of, 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 of pars uh, together over the course of several days. And then because I turned 50, there's this thing, if, you, if you've ever golfed before or you watch golf on TV, there's this thing called the Senior Tour, right? And it's for professional golfers who are now 50. So like all the old golfers that I used to watch when I was a kid, they're now on the senior tour, but you have to be 50 or older. So on Monday, when we're driving to the course, Lydia doesn't know this, but I'm thinking, like, I could be a millionaire because I could string together uh, several rounds of golf, uh, shooting par, and then I could, I could try to get my, my, my tour card for the senior tour, and, and we would just be, uh, we'd be set, right? Now, now. Even though I'm kidding, that's actually kind of how my brain works, which is a scary thing. Uh, <clears throat> and some of you that know me well know that that is sort of the nature of who I am. Um, but but here's, the, here's, the, here's the sad reality. Uh, when we were only about halfway done, right? There are 18 holes. That's a round of golf. When we were only about halfway done... Actually, it only took about one hole. But, but we were about halfway done. All of, that, all of that excited potential, it turned into the sad disappointment of the current reality. And at that point, as reality struck in, my current... Uh, status or situation, sort of like I felt the weight of that. In other words, like I'm not very good at golf. Uh, at that point, I had a new motivation or a new sort of direction, and it was this. I was just trying to enjoy my time with my wife and just get through a terrible round of golf. Life can be like that, can't it? Like you have these periods of life that are just like that. They start out these periods of life with, with, with great potential. 
the, the, the excitement over what could possibly be. But then you're d deeply disappointed. And, and you're just trying to make it through. Like this next period of my life, it's not going to be what I had hoped it would be. So rather, instead, I'm just going to make it through life with the ones that I love. And if you're not careful at times, here's what, here's what happens. The whole world can become your enemy. And everyone else, everyone else is against you. And you take on this attitude of it's just, it's just me and the missus uh, against the whole world. We see that sort of uh, excitement turned to disappointment in today's scripture passage in the book of Genesis. We're going to be in Genesis 15 and 16. And you'll see the, 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 uh, the potential, the excited potential in, in one of our readings. And then you'll see the sort of disappointed reality in the other passage today. And we see this in the lives of, of the married couple named Abraham and Sarah. Maybe you can relate. Certainly there's something for us to learn from this. Let's, let's jump right in. Genesis chapter 15 is our first reading. I'll read out loud and you follow along silently. Genesis chapter 15. It says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram, and I'm, I'm just going to refer to these two characters as Abraham and Sarah from here on out. Um, their names are changed a little bit later. But I think we know that Abraham and, and Sarah are ultimately who they're, who they're called. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. This is God talking to Abraham. He says, fear not, Abraham. I am your shield." And your reward shall be very great. It's a good way to start the next period in your life, right? God comes to you and says, I'm going to reward you. Verse 2. But Abram said, O Lord, what will you give me? For I continue to be childless. I continue to be childless. And the, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus, who was one of his workers, one of his employees in that culture because he had no children. One of his highest ranking employees would receive all of his uh, inheritance. Now remember, the reason that Abraham is pushing back against God's statement is God saying, I'm going to reward you. Abraham's saying, I don't have a child. Remember from weeks past, the reason Abraham is saying that is because God has already said that your promise, or that my, my blessing is going to be born out in your offspring, in your children. I will make of you a great nation. And Abraham's like, yeah, right. I don't even have a, I don't have a kid. Verse 3. <clears throat> And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. God says, This man, this employee of yours, this man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside. God takes Abraham out of his tent. Takes him outside. He says, look toward heaven. And number the stars. If you are able to number them. I don't know if you went outside this week. Uh, I'm sure you went outside this week. But I don't know if you went outside late one night when we had the the blood wolf moon or whatever it was. But the stars, at least out in baby, the stars were just incredible. There was very little humidity in the air. And, and as I looked up, they, they appeared countless to me. But that's, what, that's what God's doing here. He takes Abraham out and he says, look at all these stars. 
says, count them. Go ahead, if you're able. And then God said to Abraham, so shall your offspring be. Verse 6, a high water mark in Abraham's life. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. The word of the Lord, for which I give thanks. Now, with no commentary, we're going to go on. We're going to go on to, Ge to Genesis 16 now. Now, Sarai, who will later be called Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne Abram no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. This is a particularly wicked, immoral act of giving your maid over to your husband that she might birth um, a child in your place. Continuing with the text. <laughs> and Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, the Egyptian her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress, that being Sarah. She looked at Sarah with contempt. And Sarah said to Abram, may the wrong be done to me, I'm sorry, may the wrong be done to me be on you. I gave my servant to you, or to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. The word of the Lord. Okay, today's story is a hard story. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's hard to imagine. I would encourage you not to spend a whole lot of time dwelling on it. But maybe you can relate, not exactly, but let me ask you, have you ever experienced a situation where you needed a solution and you needed it fast? You needed a solution to some problem and you couldn't wait anymore and you needed it, you needed it so fast that you devised a particularly sinful shortcut to fix your problem? And then the whole thing blows up in your face? You know, what was I thinking? Maybe you can relate. That's what happens here, Sarah, and it, that's what happens here with, with Sarah and Abraham's plan. Uh, as soon as the servant lady was with child, she's already despising Sarah. And, and as soon as Hagar uh, is with child, uh, Sarah, uh, she already hates Abraham for what has happened. And his part in it. So today what we're talking about is living in that space between excited expectation and the disappointment of your current reality. Maybe that's you. You used to be excited about, about what, was, what was coming next or, or, or a few years ago you were excited about the potential uh, of, of this current period in your life, but, but now... You've given up hope. We've got three characters in this story, right? We've got Sarah, and what's going on with Sarah? She went from hoping, because she had listened to God's voice, and Abraham had told her what God 
had said, and I can imagine when, when, when Abraham is meeting directly with God that Sarah is, is peeking out of the tent or, or she's listening in. She knows the promise that God has made. And so Sarah goes from hoping to carry a child for herself in Abraham, this child that is the promised child that will, that will make of them a great nation. She, she's gone from that that excited potential, that hope, to now the reality of barrenness and the reality that she's an old woman. And then there's Hagar, this Egyptian lady. She went, she went from hoping that this, that this wicked union between her and her boss's husband she went from, from hoping that this wicked union might cause Abraham to actually love her. And, 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 and this wicked union, it might actually bring her dignity and, and, and worth. And maybe she would actually be treated as Abraham's wife. She went from that excited expectation to the reality of life as an outcast. And the abuse that comes with being a slave girl. We didn't read the rest of the story, but they kick her out of the house and she, she wanders in the desert for a time until God delivers her. And then there's Abraham. It's hard to be super sympathetic with Abraham, right, when we read the story. But Abraham, he has his own burden. He went from hopefulness. Remember, we read in, in 15, he believed the Lord and the Lord counted that as righteousness. That's such a, significant, <clears throat> such a significant phrase that we find it again in the, in the New Testament when Abraham is, is lifted up as a man of faith and he was a man of faith not because of all the good things that he did but because he believed in God and God counted that as righteousness. That high water mark. He went from that, that hopefulness that, that God will do what he said he's going to do. He will make of my offspring a great nation. He went, he went from that to the reality of the, the death of his dream. Probably a lot of middle-aged men in this room today who feel like there's been a death of their dream. And in a sick, in a sick way... Uh, hopeless middle-aged men do sometimes turn to the arms of another woman, as did Abraham. It's a, it's a broken pattern. It's so telling. Uh, we, we already read this, so we're not going to revisit the text. But it's so telling that Sarah says to Abraham, the Lord has kept me from conceiving. The Lord has kept me from from conceiving, and so she's saying, the Lord hasn't done anything to solve this problem, so Abraham, let's take matters into our own hands. It's the title of today's sermon, because aren't we, aren't we wired, aren't we geared in, in, in the same way when we can wait on God no longer, so we decide to take matters into our own hands? It's as if Abraham and Sarah agree, let's do for ourselves what God has not done for us. So if you're feeling today uh, a lack of hope, and it may not be some great tragedy in your life today, it may just be a sense of dull disappointment that's grown dreadfully old. Yeah, and you're just going through the motions, you know, just mailing in at work, uh, just, just, just mailing it in at home, nothing really sparking your affections. I, I want you to know that is not the way of Christ. I want you to know that is not God's intention for your life. I want you to know there is a way out of that. And what we're talking about today is this, how to escape hopelessness. 
That's what I want us to talk about. Number one. Number one. In, 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 in the answers to how to escape hopelessness. Number one. I will stop blaming others. I will stop blaming others. That's exactly what Sarah is doing in this scenario. In her hopelessness, she, she's looking for an enemy. The first enemy she comes to, because he's the easiest target, is her husband. She said to him, quote, May the wrong done to me, Abraham, be on you. On you. May the wrong done to me be on you, husband. I would ask you today, who are you, who are you blaming for your disappointment? And I really struggle with this. Who are you blaming? You should stop it. It's not good for you. Who, who are you blaming? Uh, who are you blaming for your lack of achievements? Sarah was blaming Abraham, and, and Abraham was in a sense blaming Sarah and her barrenness. Didn't really know it was her, but, but he blamed her. And he, he, that's seen in the fact that, that, that he says, he, he says, <clears throat> if I sleep with Hagar, like, that's what I really want to do. And we'll see this in coming weeks, the, how this story plays out. But, but here's, here's the sad reality. Uh, Abraham, he, he, did, he did get a son um, through his wicked union with Hagar. He got a son uh, who they called Ishmael, who is described in just a few verses. We didn't read it today, but Ishmael, this son, is described in the Bible as a wild donkey of a man. <clears throat> look, at, look it up. You can see it later on in, in chapter 16. Um, and, and, and not only that, Scripture tells us, uh, this is what it says. Uh, it says that, that of, of Ishmael, it says that his, his hand was against everyone and everyone's hand was against him. Meaning he was a man of conflict. Meaning he was a man of, of chaos. And I'm sure, I'm sure that Abraham loved him. But he was not the son that God had promised. In fact... That son w would not be born for another 14 years. And his name will be Isaac. So if you're living in a state of, 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 of hopeless chaos, a sense of the, the, the death of a dream, uh, first question I would ask you is who, who are you needlessly blaming? Maybe you're blaming your boss. He just, he's, he's holding me down. I'm not achieving what, I, what I've always aspired to achieve. And it's my boss's fault. Maybe it's your clients. If you are, um, if you own your own business. Maybe you have a few employees and it's, it's your clients. You just don't have the right clients and it's their fault. Maybe you... <clears throat> Maybe you're blaming your, your, your church. Man, I've been, I've been around long enough to know that some of you, I don't even know it, but some of you are blaming your problems on the church. I'm 50 now, so, you know. <clears throat> I, uh, uh, I've seen a lot. <clears throat> Sadly, some of us are blaming our spouse. You know. Always against me. Never lets me, never lets me do what I want. Holding me back. I'm talking about how to escape hopelessness today. Number one is that I, I, will, I will stop blaming others. Number two, I will, I will trust God's timing. I will trust God's timing. Man, when we, when we don't trust God's timing, we get ourselves in 
some wicked situations. We get ourselves into some bad deals. When we rush headlong, I mean, there are times, you've been there, I've been there, where, where I know, where you, where you know that you're supposed to wait on the Lord. But you just, you just can't wait any longer. I'll trust God's timing. Man, this is difficult. You know why it's difficult for me? Because I come up with some pretty awesome plans on my own. You know why this is difficult for me? Be because because <clears throat> not, only, not only do I come up with super awesome plans, but I think to myself, I have impeccable timing. But not in hindsight, right? Not in hindsight. You're, you're, you're waiting today. And what you must do is you must, you must wait on the Lord. Maybe you're waiting on, on a house to sell. Or maybe you're waiting, uh, waiting for your spouse to, to, to come along. Or maybe you're waiting for a new job or the next job or any job. And look what Proverbs 16.9 says. Proverbs 69, it says, the, the mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Now, this is not meant to be like, like a sarcastic attitude that God has, like, you think you're all that, but I'm really the one in charge. That, that's not the intention of this proverb. It's not to put you down or, or to say that you're your mind and your thoughts and your plans are of no value. That is not the point. What, what's God saying here? I, I believe the point is this. You, go ahead and, and, and make plans. Plan out your life. But, but hold, those, hold those plans loosely. Not, not with a death grip. Just realize that, that, that God is ultimately the one who directs your steps. And in fact, find, find solace in that. Find deep comfort in that. That you really, you really can't go wrong. You really can't thwart God's plans. If, if God is really for you, which he is, and, and if God has, has laid out for you, he has engineered a life and an eternity for you before you were ever born, which he has, if that's true, then rest in that. You cannot shatter that. You cannot ruin God's plan for your life. He directs your steps. Rest in that. Make plans. Be an organized person. As, as Christ's followers, we should be, um, the, the, we should be um, uh, the, 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 the ones who are the best engineers and the ones who are the most innovative and the ones who, who are the, the, do make great plans for our lives and dreamers and visionaries, as it says in the book of Acts. Do all that, but hold that loosely, resting in the fact that you really can't go wrong. You can't screw it up. God directs your path. God directs your steps. Think on this. God's desire and Abraham, Sarah's desire, it was the same desire. It was the same plan. God was not working at cross purposes with Abraham and Sarah. They're crying out, bless us with a child. And that's exactly what God was going to do. Their desire was the same, but their timing was different. And this is what caused them to doubt God. To trust his timing, dear friends, if you say, like, I trust God's timing, to trust his timing, it means that I build my plans around waiting on the Lord. Let me say that again. To trust 
God's timing in your life. It means that you build your plans around waiting on the Lord. To say, I'm waiting on the Lord while you are secretly devising an escape plan is not waiting on the Lord. It's like you're waiting on the Lord on the outside, but inside, you're not. You're devising a way out. Let me ask you, do you believe that God's reward for you is great? Some of us must really need. Let's go away again. Some of us must really. I'm going to take. I'm going to. I'm just going to yell, I guess, because I've lost this again, right? Oh, I'm still on. Oh, you know what happened was I was in there, and now I've lost that. Yeah, there we go. I had really dropped out the time before, though, right? Or had I not? Okay. Oh. All right. All right. Um. But here's my question: Do you believe that God's reward for you? is great. Some of us don't. Some of us feel as though God has abandoned us. Do you believe that God can defy the impossible in your life? Neither did Abraham, and it cost him a lot. I, I encourage you today to trust God in his timing. And number three, as we talk about escaping hopelessness, I won't waste my waiting. It's kind of, a, kind of an odd phrase, but, but think on what I mean by this. I won't waste my waiting. If everything is purposeful in life, then this period of waiting in your life is purposeful as well. Let me tell you a story. In the last couple of weeks, I went to this, this place, this place in Brownsville that I will affectionately refer to as my Bethel. Now, if you, you, that may mean nothing to you, but let me explain what I mean by that. Bethel. From the last few weeks of sermons, we, we realized that Abraham would go to Bethel. And Bethel was an actual uh, place on the map at that time. Uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a place where he would go and he would meet with God in significant ways. It's where he first heard the word of the Lord. It's where he began to follow God. You have a, a Bethel, a place where God has showed up, shown up uh, in, in a really deep and profound way in your life. Or maybe it's a place where you go often to meet with the Lord. It's your, it's your Bethel. So, so I have a place like that where I've gone for the last 12 years. There's nothing really special about the place, but it's just been the consistency of it. I've gone there regularly to meet with the Lord over the last 12 years. So I went there a few weeks ago, and, and, and my, my, my point in going there was I wanted to pray about something very specific, something that, a decision that I was trying to make. But as I went to my Bethel a few weeks ago, I've been there a few more times since, but as I went there a few weeks ago, I didn't get to pray uh, about what I went there to pray about for quite some time, because for about 45 minutes, I was, I was overcome with the emotion of remembering the prayers that I had prayed over this last season of my life, over the last 12 years, and how God had really answered those prayers. The next, the, later on that day, I called Lydia, and I just told her what a profound time that was. I went there thinking that I was going to spend time praying about some new problem, but, but really what God had for me that day was he wanted me to just recall over the last 12 years how he had moved 
It, ha the number of children that we have to this day, I, I, I remembered and celebrated prayers that I'd prayed at that place regarding that and, and, and my adult children and, and, and just different aspects of their lives and what's going on in their lives. And, and I remembered and celebrated how God has been faithful in my waiting and in my, in my fervent prayers for them. And I thought about how, how River Church was, was born out of a deep season of prayer and, 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 a, and a burden on my heart. And I would go there to my Bethel and, and pray regularly. And I would wait. And I would think often with all of these prayers, when will the Lord deliver? How long, O oh Lord, until you answer these prayers? And I thought of how there were financial difficulties that I've that I've had in the past and I thought they would never come to an end and how, how that season now has come to a close and God was faithful. I thought about how I would go there and I would pray for my father who was sick at that time and, and he passed away but God was faithful in those prayers and I remembered and I celebrated Several other prayers that I have prayed over the last 12 years, this season of my life, and, 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 and God is faithful. My point is, don't waste your waiting. Embrace it. Are you wasting this period of your life? I see a lot of young adults do this. There's something that hasn't come to fruition yet, so they just, they just piddle about, play about their lives, sleep when they should be awake, play when they should work. They just piddle about, and then, I mean, it's really even just as true about us middle-aged people as well. Are you wasting this period of your life? You might say, well, how do you do that? What does that look like practically? What does it look like when a person wastes their life? Uh, I would give you a... I'd give you a three or four ideas. One is we live in isolation. One of the ways that you waste your life is you live in isolation. You disconnect. Have you become private and introverted and, 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 and often it's a result of some disappointment in your life? I don't know what God's timing is in your life. Let me say this again. Regarding, regarding your current burden, I don't know what God's timing is in your life, but here's what I do know. God wants you to be connected to the body of Christ. That is one way in which you can embrace your waiting, is you can become a part of the body of Christ. You can get connected here at River Church. This is one of the primary ways that we, that we uh, embrace our waiting, is we share it with others. We live in community in the midst of our waiting. How do I not waste my waiting, Pastor Randy? One is, don't live in isolation. The second thought, second way in which you are uh, wasting your waiting is that... that your lack of patience is causing you to consider some particularly wicked sin right now. I'm certain there are some people in this room right now who you're tired of waiting and so you're going to do something about it like Abraham and Sarah did. Maybe your financial stress is such that you're tired of waiting and you're considering breaking the law. Maybe you're a middle-aged man like Abraham and your dream is now long gone and you're considering a, a, a wicked path. Maybe you're, uh, maybe you're tired of waiting uh, you're not yet married, but you're just going to go ahead and sleep with your girlfriend because you're just tired of waiting. One of the ways that we don't waste, or one of the ways that we waste our waiting is we give up and we consider, we justify deep sin. Like, I'm tired of waiting on the Lord. I'm just going to take it, take matters into my own hands. A third way 
in which you waste your waiting is by not resting. Or maybe you're a person of, of, of want and strife and worry and stress. Maybe, you're, maybe your name could be Ishmael. You're, you're, you're always against other people and people are always against you. Or, are you a person of strife and stress and you're not resting? That is one way in which you waste your waiting is you find no rest in this period. A fourth way that you waste your waiting is you bail on people. You bail on people. Like, like you're here, sort of, but you're also sort of checked out. You, you, you're in relationships, but you're not really in relationships. You're in and you're out, and you, and you bail on people. You become judgmental. You see, when we are disappointed, we like to blame other people. We see that in Sarah. We see that in Abraham. I see that in myself. So in conclusion, I ask you this. What are you waiting on God for this morning? What are you waiting on? I want you to embrace that waiting. I don't want you to waste it. Uh, what do you, may, maybe you're waiting on a job. Maybe you're waiting on, an, on a, another person. Like it's your move, man. Maybe you're waiting on the completion of school or a spouse to show up. Maybe you're waiting on wellness. Maybe you're a sick person and you just need God's healing in your life. What are you waiting on this morning? Here's what I want you to hear. Here's a Christian ethic. Here's a, here's a truth from Scripture. God remembers. God knows. Here's a picture of God I want you to have in your own mind. God is simultaneously preparing for you a home in heaven. Yes, he is. And we look forward to eternity. He is simultaneously preparing for you a home in heaven and working all things together for your good here on earth. He is doing both of those things simultaneously. Can you trust him this morning? If so, I want you to tell him that. In your own weakness, in your own sorrow, if you can trust him in that, I want you to tell him that. And, and we're going we're gonna, to uh, project a prayer here. Maybe this, could, maybe this is... Maybe this is the attitude of your heart. Maybe you can make this prayer your own. He says, God, I believe that you are calling me to wait on you for a good reason. So see if you can make this your prayer. God, I believe that you are calling me to wait on you for a good reason, even though I don't fully understand that reason. I want to be patient. And I want my faith to last for the long haul. I believe you are building me a home in heaven and you are working things together for my good. God, help my unbelief. If that's your heart's attitude today, make this your prayer. I'm going to give you just a few seconds of silence. You can, you can silently... I'll read through it one more time, but you can just silently right now read through it. And if that's your heart's attitude, make this your prayer right now. And if you would, if you would bow your heads, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray this prayer out loud one more time.